episode of Reptile Fight Club. And as I hit record, the dogs start barking. How wonderful. Um, hopefully you can't hear that. <laughs> anyway, welcome. <laughs> we're, we're back. And we've got uh, Rob here as well. How's it going, Rob? I'm great. Yeah, great awesome. to be here with uh, you and our guest tonight, Lucas Lee. Said he's making his Reptile Fight Club uh, first appearance initially. I never appearance, thought right? this day would come. I'm very embarrassed <laughs> by this fact. I, for some reason, I thought we had a had a show in the past, but I guess we've been on a few podcasts together, and so it's like true. Seems That's like true. We, it all blends together. Yeah, I thought you'd been on, or I'm I'm pretty sure we had had discussions about getting you on as well. But maybe well, it doesn't really about. matter the forum if you're talking to me. We're fighting, so <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can understand exactly. the confusion. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it's about freaking time. So I apologize for. <laughs> Not having you on sooner, but glad. Very uh, happy to be here, fellas. Glad we are in here together and I'm looking forward to fighting with you a little bit. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, (laughs) I don't know. I I got uh, Woma eggs today. So not a bad way to, to, not a bad sight to see. Although My favorite sight. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I I did have a, there was like a little, uh, it was kind of like a boob egg, but the, the little the smaller part was separated and it had a little string between. And so I'm, you know, pulling the eggs and I'm like, Oh, and I just went to pluck it off. And all of a sudden all the yolk started leaking. Never pulled the, the dingleberry. I know. I'm like, well, what is wrong with me? How do I not think these things through? You know, <laughs> why didn't I just leave it on? And it was one of the good eggs and it wasn't the best clutch. There were only like three good eggs in there and a, and a fairly good sized slug. At least I think it's a slug, but I left, put it in the, in the incubator and I learned from last year, I turned on my incubator well in advance. So there's no <laughs> spikes and evil things to kill eggs and disrupt uh, the, the balance of things. So anyway, excellent. good to have eggs on the ground. Happy to see that. that Sorry, is I just was so excited. I had to get that out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think so my woman's are about a week behind you. So fingers okay. crossed. And now I won't pull the dingleberry. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Learn from my errors. <laughs> yeah, you didn't cut blackhead eggs, right? Or did you? Uh, oh, so two years ago was the great blackhead egg cutting debacle. And oh, then okay. last year I did get a clutch, but I was on tour and nobody found them. So I didn't have a chance to kill them. They died on their own. Uh, this year I might get another shot, though. Western yeah. is off food and looking good. Yeah, my female's close to Lane as well. She's she had her. That's three shed. years in a row. I know she's a she's a machine. Dang, <laughs> but she, but you're too I, good. If I could only do good with the eggs. That would be wonderful. So <laughs> yeah. yeah, you and me both. <laughs> yeah, last year I had I had that spike in the temperature and cooked them a little bit, and so the babies came out kind of wonky with small eyes or missing eyes, and I still have two of those. They're still going, you know, yeah. going along. They still require me to. Help them out a little bit, put a put a rodent in their mouth and sit, hold still and let them figure out that it's food. So they're doing OK, but still a little bit of the hair pulling out stage, you know, yeah. <laughs> trying to spit it out every chance. They can get just well, like, leave it in there. Morph, Morph Market tells me that you should post those up. That seems like today's drama. Maybe we can fight about that in the future. Maybe, <laughs> yeah, maybe right. that should be your next posting. Uh huh. Yeah. I don't I'm, even I'm, know about this. <laughs> I, I'm really like conflicted what to do with them. Like just give them to somebody or to well we'll have to fight about it you know because (laughs) again today's i guess someone had uh, posted on morph market i didn't even see it but several people were sending it around there were plenty of agitated facebook posts about like there was a split lip one-eyed exanthic water monitor that someone was pitching on there you know didn't include the price or whatever um you know and all that so we yeah well we can we can talk about that because i do see two sides to that notably on both the the price wasn't included, so and I believe the ad's been ad's been pulled. The seller's been banned. You know, there's oh, there's God. plenty there. Well, for of us course, to talk yeah. About in the future, so yeah. When in yeah, doubt, ban ban it out. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, well, we can, and, we can mean, talk I've, about that later. <laughs> yeah, I've had I've had uh, like baby, you know, blue tongue skinks, northern blue tongues that have been, you know, born with, you know, slight kinks or something like that, and I'll just give them to somebody. I actually gave one mm-hmm. to my cousin's kid. And she, she made like a, an Instagram for it, you know, and like took really good care of it. And it had more, more followers than I did, you know, it was like <laughs> a very popular little, uh, special needs skink. So, 
Um, well, I mean, you know, except my, I guess my point would be accepting the potential price point, which, as I say, I didn't see, not not something that I'm looking into or whatever. Um, yeah. Accepting the price point, really, then anyone who's saying that that's problematic is advocating that it should be euthanized. So, to me, that's sort of the like. If you look at it, that dichotomy, maybe that's what we can talk about in a future episode. Yeah. Is, you know, from my perspective, anyone who's saying absolutely that that's wrong, that that should be available, uh, again, price notwithstanding. Um, that's what they're saying. So yeah. if it's not perfect, then you got to euthanize it. So, hey, that's that's pretty heavy. Yeah. Right. Mm. Yeah. Well, I mean, what's and I don't know I don't that know. people are realizing that that's what they're saying when when they're taking that approach. But that's how it. At least someone could read it. Um, mm. So that's why I say I think there maybe there's something there to talk about. More yeah. complicated. I think should be the ever, most expensive reptile on morph market. All those broken genes. All those mutations. Hey. I know. You That's a world's first dolphin head out of this, you know, <laughs> <laughs> maybe so. Right. Yeah. So yeah. probably code neither on neither here nor there, but <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, anyway, yeah. after I've derailed that enough. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know. I, I just watched a, <laughs> a YouTube video with the, the, uh, Payne's Python. Oh, what's it? Oh, yeah. Gosh, Michael Pythons Payne. and lizards or whatever. Yeah. The yeah. extreme herping guys. That's yeah. that's the channel, yeah. Extreme herping, and they were out in uh, the Brigalow Belt and found that like an inland in the carpet. Kai Gould? Um, no, Michael Payne and uh, oh, okay, different one. Yeah, yeah. gotcha. Oh, I can't recall. I'm terrible with names, but anyway, <laughs> the the other guy that he herps with too. <laughs> but it was uh, I think it was Michael this time, and I I'm hoping I'm getting his name right. <laughs> Um, but anyway, yeah, I'm, I'm great at this. Um, anyway, they, they uh, found an inland carpet out uh, near oh, Arbor, sweet. which was uh, pretty, it was nice. It was uh, something that I would like to see someday. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. That's fantastic. I'll have to check to, that one out. That's pretty cool. Yeah, It's yeah. pretty neat. It's towards the end of the video. He, he spends a lot more time on the elapids than he does on the inland carpet. I'm like, come on, you get five seconds for the inland and like, you know, he's falling around a mulga for like, you know, 15 <laughs> minutes or something. That's funny. <laughs> I'm exaggerating, okay. of course, but yeah, mulgas nice. are fun. I, I, you know, I don't fault them for that, but show a little bit. The more female of inland that I got from you is getting really red. I'm yeah? stoked oh, on nice. her. Yeah. yeah. He's oh, like a nice one. Awesome snakes. <laughs> yeah, they are. Yeah. I, uh, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a little dubious. I'll get eggs this year from, from my, mm. uh, females. I haven't really seen much. You did too good last progression. year. They need to humble you. I guess I, well, I didn't do that great <laughs> last year either. It was the, didn't, I thought you had yeah. like three, four clutches. No, I just had one uh, clutch last year and that it was the year before that I had two. I think it was the year before that. Yeah. Anyway, I take it back. <laughs> I know I suck, but uh, <laughs> they're just always humbling you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but you know, it is what it is. I guess they really, um, I, I really need to probably get some new caging, get some, you know, just improve things overall. I I've got some kind of janky stuff going on, like, you know, just like old stuff that I've had for a while. And I just haven't taken the time to make new caging and get that squared away. I just need to get out there and do it. Mm. I keep using that as an excuse to buy new tools and then I buy the tools, but I don't use them to build the caging. So <laughs> I need to just make that happen. But you know, it's, if it's not, uh, I don't know if it takes too much time, it usually gets put on the back burner, you know, so I'm like, ah, stupid. You're a busy guy. Uh, yeah. What do you do? I did, I did learn from the chat about, uh, the, that cement, uh, hydraulic cement. I'm kind of excited mm -hmm. about that. It's like fast drying and strong. It won't chip as easily. So I'm going to try that out for some fake rock work and well, see if that nice. helps me get excited about it. I got some of these cheap, like stacking, uh, um, they're like front opening stackable things and, okay. uh, you know, just shelves or whatever. And, I, and they're perfect size for Antaresia. And I just want to do some like fake rock work and kind of, but I, I need a way to keep them closed because they have kind of a magnetic close, but it's not strong mm -hmm. enough to keep a snake from pushing the door open if it wanted to. And so I need to figure that out and. You know, get to find a good way. Probably put some heat cable under the fake rock or something. And do something cool. Ah, uh, DIY heat rocks. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <That's> a, <laughs> what could go wrong, right? DIY, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
DIE maybe if it's if it goes the wrong way. Yeah. I thought about using them for the um knobtail geckos too, so maybe that would be a better plan because they're not gonna push the doors open. But I saw Are you're you breeding for an, an amie. Snakes, you're Rob? bidding on an amie, so Oh you, you yeah, to, I was I've got I've got a couple males if you want one of them. <laughs> it was ill advised. It's it, you know, it, I didn't have the money to spend on it, but I was yeah. trapped in a car and it looked cheap and pretty, so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we find ourselves in those situations. But someday, right? that is a species I would love to work with. Oh, they're, they're fun. Very yeah. Pokemon esque. Yeah. yeah, I've got. I I picked up a pair of uh, Asper. The the I, I don't even know the common name. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> I don't either, but I know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. So uh, and uh, they're they're doing good. They're pretty cool. I've got one white male and a black female. So we'll see. Sweet. See what I can get out of those guys. They're pretty cool. Uh, that's always been a dream species for me. And they've always been really difficult for people, but I was talking to some guys at uh, Tinley and they're like, Oh man, I figured it out. I started producing a bunch of them and they're doing great. And here's the secret. I'm like, okay, well maybe mm. I'll try it out. Plus the price about was in half from what yeah. it has been mm. previously. So that helped a lot. <laughs> yeah. no uh, doubt. That's crazy. awesome. I mean, those are really fantastic. Yeah. It's yeah. really a dream. Both, I mean, Amy A. Asper, Shea, all that stuff, the, just yeah. that look, truly, you know, so alien and whatever. Yeah. So. Yeah. Sentient yeah. rocks. Yeah. yeah. The Amy A. are my favorite geckos. They're so cool. And that's yeah. what I'm hoping to find on the big 50th uh, trip. So save up your right. uh, money there, Lucas. You got to join us out there in Central. <laughs> I would love to. Go find a Centralian. <laughs> that's right. To live up to your namesake. Right? I, I feel like nobody that. I talked to in the NPR world has found one since Casey Cannon yeah. back in like 2018 or whatever. So it, we're due as a group. <laughs> yeah, right. Has anybody been out there looking? Oh, I, guess I don't Matt, know. Matt was out there. Matt te- <laughs> it does uh, help to look. Matt on the podcast and he, he didn't see a centralian, but mm. uh, yep. That's uh yeah. that's a high one on my list. And, and speaking of which I, I really enjoyed that show with Gavin. Um, Eric sent me yeah, like it was a, great. Truly, yeah. truly uh, great to have him. You know, we we're funny gonna, guy. just going to do a standard yeah. student of the serpent or whatever. And, um, you know, it was great then to, I mean, essentially, we had, is more or less the same conversation we had had in, what, November 1st, 2019 or whatever, when yeah. uh, we were eating crock parm and all uh, in Darwin. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was pretty cool. And then before the first time I held an Owen Pelly Python in yeah. the Darwin uh, Botanical Garden. So that was something, hey? That's awesome. Um, but yeah, no, that was really good. He did awesome, and it was great to yeah get a chance to have him share so much of that stuff in a public space. Yeah, I always enjoy listening to his shows. He was on uh, the Aussie Wildlife Show, and that was a, yep. a great episode as well. It's yeah. just really fun. To I feel like we to. went a little bit longer, yeah. and you know, yeah. kind of maybe into a little bit additional depth or whatever, because that yeah. was I don't I don't think it's still going at this point, but it was a little bit uh, the perspective obviously is a little bit different. But yeah. Uh, yeah, that was really good, and that was basically the only other one beforehand, I think. So yeah, um, there was there was one other, I think. But yeah, anyway, it, he he's he's really enjoyable to listen to. And I I've hung out with him a couple times. Like we we had he was at the uh, one of the symposia that I was at, and uh, and also we had a dinner with him at one point, and I sat by him at dinner. It was really, I mean, he's just. A wealth of knowledge and I'm really excited yeah. to get together with him again and pick his brain and yeah. Cause Absolutely. when, when we were in Darwin, um, we had one of those issues with the guy who put on the symposium was a dirt bag. Right. And, and so everybody <laughs> kept their distance from us because of him, because mm-hmm. we were coming to his symposium. So therefore we were also dirt bags, you know, it was like, we didn't know he was a dirt bag. We don't know. We just wanted a free trip to Australia to come and talk about reptiles. You know, we didn't care, <laughs> but I mean, in retrospect, we did care because that dirt bag left me stranded in Darwin and, and I didn't, you know, but anyway, I think, um, Gavin did, uh, hang out or, or was welcomed us to croc crocosaurus cove he wasn't there on the day i was there and then when i found out i was being um swindled he the guy was you know the organizer of the symposium stole my books and left me stranded in darwin and so i was trying to figure out how to get out of there and and so nick and i didn't go to crocosaurus cove and watch rico and 
um, Mark swim in the cage of death. And we kept teasing and saying they had to go into Amplexus while they were in the cage of death. <laughs> that was kind of the running joke, but, um, they didn't do it. Those wimps. So anyway, yeah, we missed out on that, which was kind of crappy. So I feel bad about you that. You get but, swindled and stranded in unknown lands. I think there's a bit of leeway there for yeah. lands not going right. <laughs> I was being kind of stubborn. I'm like, fine, I'm just going to stay here. I'm going to, I'm going to stay in Darwin. <laughs> you didn't leave me here. I left me here. <laughs> I stayed <laughs> my own free volition. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So well, I hopefully gave you those books. Your, your ne- the negative experiences of your first trip will just be building that much good credit towards when we go in the fall. So yeah. that, that would be the hope, I guess, on my end. And I, and I wonder too, if that was kind of one of the reasons I didn't, I wasn't really excited to go back there. I wonder if that might've been kind of subconsciously right. what was keeping me from it. It's like, I just had such negative feelings there. You know, it's like, I don't want to go, but yeah, obviously that won't happen again. <laughs> hey, maybe a little I'm, Shay I before, uh, yeah, before yeah, the that Amy will, I, that'd be all that right. Will. You probably wouldn't be complaining too much. I'd guess. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if we can target those, that would be fantastic. And I'm sure, you know, we'll be in the right places. Looking, yeah, we, so. I know the spot. We've been on, yeah. on the spot and all that. And, mm-hmm. yeah. I think Ryan Young saw a Shai out there. Did, you yeah, guys didn't see one, did you? No. as a, oh. Well, so I think there are a couple of spots that are close to where we were on, as I say, on a spot that definitely uh, suits it and where they're found and things, but not at night. Uh, as we were at a different place uh, at that time. So it's not, it would have been exceedingly unlikely, you know, yeah. to, to see one in that context. So no, but uh, yeah, I'd be excited to. Yeah. And if, Did if see the Eric, big, uh, what are the big cave geckos oh, that are yeah. up there? Those are really yeah. cool. Yeah. Um, I'd like to see those too. I, we saw an Oedura Jamada, like the jeweled mm-hmm. uh, velvet gecko that was pretty mm-hmm. sweet. Yeah. All that um, I mean, all those geckos up there are pretty cool for the most for the most part. Maybe you've seen a couple, you know, a couple guy ray. You've seen them all, but other than that, you know. Yeah, that's. I'm I'm really excited though to get back up there and try try for some some of those things that I missed on the on the first trip. I mean, yeah. we had a pretty good trip. We found a Darwin carpet the first night in in the area, you know, and um, found an olive and a blackhead and all these cool. Ah, things. so yeah, blackhead. Yeah. yeah. A breachy, which is no longer a breachy, apparently. They got they sunk those into Acanthurus, but they're really cool with that bright yellow throat. And this one was kind of crazy looking to me at least. I, I think a couple Australians are like, ah, they look like that around here. So but right. yeah. Cool is that trip. this year? That top ender form or whatever? No, no. That's uh this year's with uh Rob and Eric and in, in okay. uh, Darwin. Yeah. And gotcha. then the fiftieth is gonna be Central Australia. So Is that twenty twenty five? Twenty twenty five. Gotcha. All right. Yeah. Born in 75. So all the, <laughs> all the fives are my zero years. <laughs> Ooh, that's easy. Yep. Yeah. Nice. So turning 50, it's kind of crazy, but yeah, hopefully uh, it'll be a very good birthday. <laughs> we'll find right. Lots of good stuff. And I, I did ask, I talked to Gab cause you know, him, him talking about his research reminded me, oh yeah, he's the one to ask about bread a lot and where to, where to mm-hmm. go for right. those. So, you know, I'm excited to pick his brain, but yeah, he said March would be a good time to be looking for bread lie. So awesome. see what happens. He said September or March. So <laughs> we'll see. Epic. Yeah. Uh, if March, I guess we can lucky. make that work. Yeah. <laughs> Just do both. Yeah. yeah. There you go. I've, <laughs> I've always wanted to drive from Dar from uh, midnight oil song. They say Darwin down to Alice Springs. And so I thought ah, someday I'm going to do Darwin down to Alice Springs and, <laughs> That's what Matt did, Matt teaching. So he beat beat me to it, but uh, that's that not sounds a like a trip, Justin though. style trip. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not uh, Rob style, but yeah, that's all right. Though one funny <laughs> uh, humorous bit associated with sort of our what well, we've now done a half dozen of these mm-hmm. since uh, Chuck had to take a step back, and uh, I think mostly it was my internet. And certainly sort of the holiday as exemplified on the holiday show. Hopefully it sounds better, maybe not oh, perfect, yeah. but better so far. But um, the uh, that point was taken that uh, <laughs> we've, I've now had two different people send me a microphone <laughs> to utilize when recording this podcast. I have yet to actually effectuate that and get it set up and whatever. Not, not from lack of appreciation, but uh, <laughs> I will do that. Um, but yeah, it's just been a timing thing, been running crazy and all that. But uh, yeah, that was 
that was pretty darn funny. Two people, not uh, unbeknownst to one another, said, "Hey, we we hey." And I don't know what's you know if they got a head injury or whatever, but they're happy with the content. But they wish it sounded a little bit they better. Actually, want to hear what you have to say? <laughs> yeah, weird enough. So I think it was mostly the internet, but uh, two different microphones showed up at my house. So that was pretty funny. <laughs> yeah. Well, hopefully you, you can use... put them to use soon. Yeah. Yeah, okay. you can use yeah. both at the same time. Set up stereo and do surround right? sound. Yeah, that'll be wild. People don't need that, but uh, <laughs> yeah. may- maybe that's what they want. They'll have a Rob Stone overload. They'll be like, "It's too perfect," and their heads will explode. <laughs> I, feel, I feel like that's probably it's already <sighs> probably way too much, but there we go. So I did, I did want to toss that out there. So thank that's you. That's what Phil. it really thank means you, to get stoned. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there you go. Excellent. I, I I will say though, with the the Owen Pelly show, you asked some wonderful questions that I you know I was hoping that would be asked him. So yeah, thank you for uh, I chiming agree. in there and, and getting your. Got to cut Owen off those. more. More Rob. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, that but they were very like just the the best questions you could ask. So yeah, that was. I think you're you you really tuned into those kind of things and and do ask great questions and make great points. So I'm very happy you're on this podcast as well. So (laughs) all good. Well, lots of fun, but yeah. So thank you, Phil. Thank you, Rob Christian. (laughs) Ah, excellent. Yeah. Rob Rob contacted me. He's like, I want to send him a microphone. (laughs) Can can I send it to you and you send it to him? And I said, well, how about I just give you his address and then you can (laughs) send it yourself directly. He's like, yeah, that works. <laughs> and I wanted fine. it to come from him, not from, you know, from me. So, yeah, yeah that was, yeah, he's a nice guy. What I are really you saying, like. Justin? <laughs> no. <laughs> both, both Rob and Phil are about the best kind of people you could be around. So, yeah, they're good guys. 100%. Yeah. They make me think I need to be a better person. <laughs> That's the, like, <laughs> I'm thinking, what? I need to start yeah. gifting people things. Well, you know, on the last trip when Nipper gave us the book signed yeah. by, uh, at, I want yeah, to say it right. the European, but, yeah, field guide, yeah, yeah, yeah. Attenborough. Well, no, the the oh the book. oh yeah, that yeah. that was the one before, yeah, yeah. Like, all these yeah. different things. Yeah, I mm-hmm. think that's really. I wasn't great. on the Florida one with you guys, so I I missed out on that oh. one. But yeah, just makes me think, man, I need to be a better person. <laughs> like bring bring <laughs> gifts to herb trips. Uh, uh, Keith and Teresa also brought like shot glasses that were engraved with you know. Um, oh, that's awesome. I think our names yeah. on them or something. Yeah, it was really wow. nice, nice, really thoughtful. So makes me want to be better. And then we right. get to the next trip and I'll be like, oh, crap, I got to leave in three days. What, can, what crap can I give these guys? You know? <laughs> Here's a Slim Jim. <laughs> Enjoy. Everybody gets a Lake Chapala garter snake, baby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, Lucas goodness. has a Tupperware. We're like, run. <laughs> He's going to try to give us a garter snake. <laughs> <laughs> it's been known to happen. <laughs> Oh man, yeah, that's uh, schweeztastic, man. <laughs> Those garter snakes. <laughs> uh, there's there's awesome some cool stuff. garter snakes. I will I will admit that. I do want to go find that really weird one down in Arizona, the the narrow headed or whatever. Mm. That'd yeah, be cool, cool on the rim. For sure. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah. I'm actually headed down to the Grand Canyon, so my uh, daughter. Uh, she wanted to do a canyoneering trip kind of for oh, her nice. spring break. And so I'm like, yeah, I could arrange that. My buddy down in Phoenix is just, he's the man when it comes to that stuff. And so I'm like, Hey, we want to come down to Phoenix and do some canyoneering. He's like, what do you think about the grand Canyon? Would you want to do a trip down? There? I'm like, you can canyoneer in the grand Canyon. Sign me <laughs> up. <laughs> like, heck yeah. So we're going to try to do that. He said, unless it rains because the, Pools and stuff are like this clear blue color. And if it rains then they get all muddy and gross. So he's like, you want to go two weeks at least after rain. So we're going to kind of play it by ear as we get closer, but we're going down there the end of the month. uh, That sounds amazing. Do something in the grand Canyon. I might, I might have to uh, preempt our trip and yeah, Yeah. exactly. Find something down there. And my dad's like, I think that's on the South rim. And I was thinking, well, we're coming kind of from the north so i you know i don't i don't recall us going you know underneath the, all the and way it around. turns out it's sure. like on the east rim or whatever you know because right. it kind of curves up and around and yep it's on uh, navajo land so you have to get a permit from mm. the navajo nation awesome. to go down there but 
Hopefully it works out. Cool. I'm excited. My daughter's excited. So, and all my Find some other Canyon daughters critters. are all mad. They're like, dad, you know, we want to go to the Grand Canyon. You've never taken us there. I'm like, <laughs> okay, well, we've done like three trips to, to like Southern California to go to the beach. You could have said one of those trips, you want to go to the Grand Canyon, but I've never heard you <laughs> say it that emphatically. Right. So <laughs> yeah, but I guess we got to take them all to the Grand Canyon. But then I'm like, <laughs> you guys want to go canyoneering? They're like, no. But we want to go to the Grand Canyon. I'm like, okay, fine. Uh, yeah, I ruined Very a few cool. of them with my misadventures. But what do you do? <laughs> they don't like to. Camp They're either anymore. super in or super out, right? At yeah, this point, yeah. my this daughter has probably forgotten because she was somewhat younger, so she she forgot the okay the. Yeah, so this is the trip that. that'll do it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'll, I'll, fix, I'll fix her somehow. You know, so. <laughs> uh, yeah. The misadventures of the Jewlanders. <laughs> what do you do? Oh, well, anything else uh, of note happen? We want to chat about or you guys ready? Rob, are you making any snakes? Not right now. Uh, maybe later in the year, oh. all my stuff is sort of spring breeder style with, Rhino rats, probably um, Puerto Rican boas, assuming that the, you know, not a, not a pressure on it, but it's assuming the female. Um, I have one female that uh, every other year, she's just like, this is what's happening. And so obviously <laughs> have to uh, respect and abide. So Abide. That's cool. Phenomenal. And those are uh, gift only, right? You can't yep. sell those. So Absolutely. That's, a, that's a cool project. Yeah. Yeah. I like that kind of stuff. I need to read about those things. I got that book and I haven't really cracked it open yet. I've looked through it, but I haven't. It's pretty heavy. Reading. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It seems like more of a scientific work than a, than a leisurely read. So yeah, <laughs> yeah for sure. Uh, yeah. It's cool. Cool. How about I'm you, ready Lucas? You got, you, got, you got some oh. expedites coming and <laughs> you got some. Uh, I'm too eager to fight. Got too um, many more garden yeah, snakes on the way. And <laughs> I'm well, you know, it, it's funny. I, the garter snake thing has become a running joke, but I'm, they're actually almost gone. I, I do need uh -huh. to make more. So, <laughs> um, I think she's working on it. Uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm expecting two clutches of Wilma's, um, a possible third. I didn't think that the third girl was going to go, but she is upside down now and, mm -hmm. uh, looks to be proving me wrong. <laughs> um, uh, outside of that, uh, hoping for blackheads. Um, one of the female is uh, looking very promising. It's off nice. food and I can feel egg shaped things in there. So that's a good sign. Um, Maybe unfortunately, the, do the swap. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I was going to say, unfortunately that one is uh, with the mail that Nick sent me. So if it all works out and I don't kill them, then I have to send yeah, something so to that guy. To uh, but uh, yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> yeah. And then hopefully brettles, but yeah. like Rob said, you know, talk to me in four months or whatever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. That's about I it. Still, I still have a few uh, brettles left over from a couple seasons ago. So I'm not reading nice. more until I get rid of those. <laughs> totally. <laughs> They're such cool snakes. And you know, it's, my lack of putting up ads, I'm sure. Cause yeah, they're pretty stellar looking. I look at your website. <laughs> it's like the definition of insanity. I, I check about once every two weeks and it's last updated 2022. Damn it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I just updated it last week, <laughs> but uh, I didn't Am update I going to the wrong available website? or anything. No, I just put up oh. a visit page of, from our okay. Utah. Utah Herb Trip. So you can see pictures of our Utah Herb Trip. And well, that's, that's nice. Cool. <laughs> I'll uh, do that too. Yeah. That, I stand corrected. I think I put up our, uh, I don't know if I've made it live yet, but I put up our Arizona trip with the tr the twin spots too. So, okay. Um, the 2020. Well, that's very cool. But I just see a list of Womas that I can't buy from yeah. 2022 that uh, say no. outstanding. Perfect example. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're, yeah, they were very, very nice. <laughs> I know that I'm sad. Make more. <laughs> well, you have some very nice bloodlines. I'm sure I could manage a swap with you. At some point, so. Now we're talking. Yeah. Let's do it. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I did pair the wheat belts you sent me since they're kind of oh, cool. mm -hmm. like, why not? Right. But I don't think that's going to happen. 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just glad they're not killing each other. Oh yeah. They, they, they're pretty good together. Like they, mm. I mean, they, they like their food, but they're fairly good when you get them out. And then breeding, I haven't ever had any issues except the very first pair that I got out of Europe, the female killed the male. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, that was kind of <laughs> crappy, but. What do you do? Good to know. I guess I'll cohab them all. Yeah. <laughs> hey. Hey. Yeah. Are you trying to... yeah. Well, actually, let's let's have you kind of tell us where you fit into herpiculture and maybe, okay. I mean, introduce yourself a little bit, but I'm sure well, probably everybody knows Lucas from NPR no. fame. But <laughs> Whatever you've heard is, is it's a, it's not true, especially if Owen McIntyre <laughs> said it. Um, yeah, but it yes, horse's mouth. <laughs> my name is Lucas. Um, I live in Oakland and I keep and attempt to breed, uh, a pretty diverse, but <laughs> somewhat consistent collection of, uh, Australian pythons, uh, various colubrids. I'm back in the dwarf monitor game after departing briefly, um, Just the Tristis or something else? Tristis and I got Ackies again too. Ackies, yeah. <laughs> and Eric might send me his Kim. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I just I'm got in trouble. Out of Ackies. I sold, sold off the rest of mine. They just weren't. I missed them. I really missed them. They didn't make yeah. sense to keep from like a, you know, if you're thinking of like a business perspective, but mm -hmm. from like a loving the animal perspective, I really missed them. Yeah. Uh, so that's why I, I got them back. getting some, some sort of. Dwarf monitor. I'll probably get Gill and I yeah. just because they're smaller. I can keep that would them, be like, cool. Gurnia. Yeah, they're so Gill and I personable. are really cool as well. Yeah, I'm totally I'm cool. glower die, but uh, Gill and yeah. I, yeah, I haven't kept a couple of them. Those really cool animals as well. Yeah, yeah. if I, I had the, the opportunity, I'd they're, also do it. <laughs> yeah, they're a little yeah. larger, the glower die. So, Gil and yeah. I would probably well, get in better. just that tail, man. Otherwise, yeah. anyway, <laughs> maybe by body length their bodies are pretty good size pretty for similar gill and i the gill and i tend to be heavier though i think mm. you know that because glower really? man they're just they're race cars they're just yeah. these super long thin um it's true the gill and i were yeah more uh half to them um and maybe about the same snout to vent on old ones yeah mm. okay uh but the, it's just the tail you know those glower tails obviously big yeah. tail what they're two, two and a half times that, that body length. And they're cool. Yeah. Unless think, you don't keep yeah, them Yeah, you should very, get Eric to send you, know. you his. That, yeah. yeah, there you go, Lucas. The answer yeah, is you cool. should have Eric send you his. I think that's what's happening. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it go. was supposed to be in a box from Owen, but he couldn't get off work. Classic Eric stuff. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sounds right. But let's see. Uh, that's cool. Yeah, should I keep going? Is that enough? Well, do you want to um, know more about me? You're, you're where, <laughs> like, what are you? So I, I know you from, uh, I served on your committee. So this is true. This is true. Masters. And uh, yeah. So I did get my master's in zoo science, um, with Dr. Loafman, uh, through West Liberty university. Uh, so the evidence-based herpeticulture lab there, uh, which was a, a great time, um, Prior to that, I kind of cut my teeth working at East Bay Vivarium, um, getting hands on with a whole bunch of stuff without needing to bring it home, which is wonderful. Um, and yeah, I've been keeping since about 2018 now. So yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Not that long, but yeah. in yeah. the course and, of my I life, mean, you're involved in uh, carpets and coffee. And this is true. You, yes. You just co-hosted with Eric on that, on that show where I, Owen, Owen couldn't make it or something with the, at green some trees point, Eric Brahms. like made himself available to me and I grabbed on and just, he hadn't been able to shake me since. So yeah, you'll hear me on various podcasts. Uh, and as you said, carpets and coffee, uh, every other Monday, um yeah 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 good times and, ah, uh, and i work as a biologist but cool what do you what do you do the, what are your what are your uh i work your in environmental, environmental consulting um okay. so a lot of my field work revolves around uh alameda whip snake uh san francisco garter giant garter snake uh cool. Red-legged frog, tiger salamander. We've got a bunch of listed herps out here that uh, there's a lot of red tape for people trying to build 
yeah. things. And yeah. that's where we come in. <laughs> so. That's good. Somebody's got to stop them from paving over all the <laughs> habitat. Do you, have you seen uh, San Francisco garters in the wild then? I have not, but okay. a lot of my coworkers have. I just haven't been at the, the right place at the right time. Okay. That and would hopefully be a cool trip. in a we'll couple weeks. To... That'd be, uh, that's right. Yeah, we're yeah. You're going to go. Yeah, we're going for it. All right. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. Yeah, that would, that's another one that's on the bucket list someday. I'd love to see. Yeah. Looks like you, Absolutely. you're not allowed to interact with them at all. So you just kind of see them from a distance and <laughs> take some pictures. Hope, yeah. hope you have Absolutely. a good zoom but lens. Ho- hopefully we can get uh, a couple photos that'll make you anxious to go, give it a go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good luck, you guys. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I'm sure we'll report awesome. back. <laughs> yeah. And it's not too Hard of a trip for me, you know, living in northern Utah. It's just kind of straight across almost. I'll so. put you up anytime. <laughs> yeah. There you we can go. sleep in the snake room. <laughs> <laughs> right on. <laughs> I've done that a few times. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Well, um, glad to have you on finally. I again I feel bad we haven't had you on earlier, <laughs> but this is this is good timing. This will be good. Okay, so. a lot of uh Pent up fight club rage. I'm ready to there throw, <laughs> throw down. <All> right. <laughs> now, um, you've also got the lost episodes that I'd really like to hear, but you're uh, co-host. <laughs> with Nick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, come I'd on. I'd like to hear them too. <laughs> yeah. Well, they're recorded somewhere, right? Does Eric have access to those or are they? Great question. All in Nick's um, <laughs> I don't know. Just, like, I think sell them on the Patreon or something. Like <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think that they live. I have some, but yeah. then there were a bunch of other ones that I want to listen back to more that I believe live on the video editor's computer because Nick wanted to do a video thing. Uh, so yeah. But anyway, I don't know. <laughs> and now Scott wanna- and Ty are coming for that corner. Hey. Oh, Are yeah. they doing a video thing? No, not no, in terms just, of the video, but in oh, terms okay. of the in terms of making a of, podcast. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you snooze, you lose, Nick. <laughs> oh no! Don't taunt him. <laughs> he doesn't listen to this. He's gonna blame <laughs> he, me he anyway. To no podcast. I made right? <laughs> that assumption, and then he called me out on something I said on carpets and coffee, and oh, now really? I just tiptoe. <laughs> 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 I've heard you say a few things on carpet and coffee. A little You're jam, right. I don't tiptoe at all, but it's okay. I say it to, I'd say it to his face too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. He he needs it. <laughs> I love that guy, but yeah. <laughs> well, the only way he could prove us wrong would be to release that content. <laughs> mm. There you go. I'll have to find this gentleman and steal his hard drive. Exactly. Video guy. Perfect. Yeah. No, there was a really good Indeed. talk with, Dale DiNardo. That the video I, guy uh, is not the same dude who did the same thing with the A, the previous podcast, and B, the a certain magazine. Is that all that same person? That might be, but I don't know. I didn't say anything. Yeah, right? I mean, like, at some point. <laughs> okay, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> whatever. Lucas shall Fool remain neutral. <laughs> <laughs> fool me twice, and you're going to fool me again. <laughs> All right. Yeah. For a tenth time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Fool me six, six times, you're, you're in trouble. Fool me seven <laughs> times, I'm coming after you. All right. Well, um, tonight we're going to talk about cohabbing and uh, the pros and cons of, of said cohabbing and maybe some experiences we've had or yeah, um, to one side or the other. So, and uh, yeah, should be a, a fun topic for sure. Any... Uh, particular aspect of cohabbing that we want to hit on or just kind of in general i think we uh just go go I for think it we tackle yeah, I mean, it I from think all the, angles yeah 100 percent. i think this had kind of come to my awareness right because i'm mostly off the social media stuff because keith had sent a message expressing his frustration about a topic pertaining to leopard geckos which seemed <laughs> very bizarre to me, you know, in a group chat, I was like, what, what could be the genesis for this? Right. Mm -hmm. And it turns out it was associated with someone putting out content where I guess a a creator, I think, um, again, and I could be misunderstanding it because I missed the first wave. I was just trying to pick up the pieces. Um, the, the guy who does the Wiccans, wicked reptiles, right. They put out a video or something saying, 
he's doing a build and he was going to put in a male and five female leopard geckos in this cage. And apparently, I don't even know all the inner dynamics that are at play here, but the ultimately that was deemed to be problematic in some way. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) Yes. And that's sort of, you know, the either every side and either side of that is basically what brought this to the fore of saying, okay, we can talk through it. Cause I, I do think there are strong positive positives and negatives. Frankly, I'm, uh, I'd be happy to either argue a single side or be the moderator on this one because I think there are persuasive points to both, and mm-hmm. a lot of it reflects the different species and the experience of the person doing right. it, uh, yeah. not to mention the enclosure, all these different things, right? There's a ton of variables that go into it like anything. Um, but, yeah, that's kind of how we came to be here. Let's be relatively timely, and uh, I do think there are good good uh, points to either side. Yeah, I agree. All right, well. Go ahead and call it Rob, and we'll see who gets to fight Lucas. <laughs> Head. It is tails. Another. Ah. Well, you won last last time, so I did win last time. Yeah. Right. Who right so who do I fight? Maybe I'll take you both. 50/50. You two can <laughs> yeah. team up. That's fine. I'm not scared. <laughs> Man, look at the cockiness on this one. <laughs> I'm just glad Chuck's not here. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I think I think where you've been kind of kicking things around and and uh, thinking about it, maybe I'll I'll let you go and I'll moderate this one, Rob, and then. Oh, good. Uh, and then for which side? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure I'll kick in there with something or other because I I do enjoy cohabbing. But <laughs> all right, and then uh, Lucas, you want to call it? Mm. Tails, oh, please. Tails. It is tails. Uh huh. So you get the uh, get the. It's side always tails. You want? <laughs> um, is it? <laughs> yeah, I guess it, it was twice today. <laughs> shit! Now I have to make a decision. Uh I will argue against it, even though I absolutely do it. But that sounds more fun today. (laughs) Okay. Well, as the winner of the coin toss, you get to decide who goes first. I defer. You're going to chuck him. huh? All right. Rob. In honor of Mr. Poland. (laughs) Well, fabulous. Well, I would say one of the principal advantages of uh, keeping animals together well, we can even go to the, the example that was set here, right, is the you're allowing them to fill their natural behaviors by giving them access to one another, perhaps unnaturally, uh, point to Lucas, but um, you're giving them sort of perpetual access. I know, Dr. J, you're well on record of liking to keep pairs of animals together, assuming that they do well uh, in that environment, right, that you're not you're not doing it if they're consistently combating for food or if you're not providing enough options for them to get access to their fundamentals, right? Heat yeah. and heat and food, uh, heat, food, water, all these different things, maybe conditions where they could shed properly, all this different stuff. If those things are met, then you don't even notice them breeding because yeah. they're attuned to one another. It's not an artificial stimuli of you placing them together when you think it's the right time. And often you just I either arrive to find a beautiful pile of eggs or arrive a week after you've been away to find a, a pile of eggs that didn't look quite as good as it did a week before. So um, I think it does allow them to effectuate their natural behavior. And, yeah, it's, a, it's really cool as well. Well, in some cases, though, that natural behavior might be ones that you do not want to allow to be effectuated. Is that the big word you used? Sorry, I missed it. Um, <laughs> for instance, uh, I just had two rhinos almost kill each other because of their natural inclinations. And if I had not been cohabbing them, no blood would have been shed. Uh, in addition, uh, your point about uh, big asterisk. Yes, uh, cohabbing is absolutely fine. Big asterisk. If everybody can have their food, heat, water, shelter, blah, 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 needs met in this utopian enclosure in which that is the case, I think that in the vast majority of reptile rooms, uh, that is probably not the case with what people are working with. And I would point to an example that I had. I had a pair of Aki monitors in a very large enclosure. Um, and 
you know, this had multiple basking sites, multiple hides, multiple water sources, everything, you know, threefold for the animals that they, they could want. And yet still the dominant male kept the female, uh, essentially he would bully her into the nest box and wouldn't let her leave. Uh, and she almost passed. I had to spend a lot of money at the vet because she was dehydrated. She wasn't eating. Uh, there was a whole bunch of problems associated with that. Um, so while I do agree that there are instances where this can work, I don't necessarily know that there is ever a benefit to anybody, but the keeper. Um, I know it's economical for us. Uh, I know that we can see interactions uh, that we might perceive as, oh, they're cute, they're cuddling, they're laying together, they are choosing to be with each other. But <laughs> is that really of benefit to the animal where in the wild they could get away from each other whenever they wanted, whenever they felt they were done, and then they can't do that in these boxes um, and I, I, yeah, I guess I should also say I'm definitely thinking about this mostly from like a snake and lizard perspective. I'm sure that there's other things that do better together, but yeah. No, wait, let me get this straight. You, you kept a pair of male rhino rats together. Right. Well, well I'm glad well, you asked. What I was going to say is, <laughs> hey, you get to find something out, and that you that was that your quote pair of rhino rat snakes were both were actually two males. You found something Thanks, out. Thanks, Doctor Loafman. A, a, a path of discovery. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't you wouldn't have learned that otherwise. You wouldn't you have know, known if they wouldn't well, until have, uh, I tried to breed them. But yes, yeah. point taken. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I I I, say, I see what you mean. Right. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking that at the same point. The uh, the other thing that I would say, right, is it does where I thought you were going, and, and actually, so the where you actually went then makes sense to me as well. But um, I assumed what you were going to say is oh, even with an abundance of choice, right, within an enclosure, what you were finding is there does seem to be sort of a a best basking spot or a best access to water or best quote best right or a preferential mm -hmm. best ref reflecting seeming preference, right. Um, even if there are multiple, it doesn't – they're not necessarily – we might perceive them to be equitable, but it doesn't mean necessarily that the animals themselves will perceive them that way. So that's sort of where I expected you were going. The notion of them just sort of being um, shunted to the side or trapped in an area where they couldn't access any of the multiple multiple spots and things, yeah, I've seen that too. You know, I've seen that. <laughs> I saw that with uh, – a trio then of Glowardi yeah. that were together. It was two females that were together for a long time without issue, added a male. And this is going back to the sort of that lull period when uh, the, you know, Glowardi availability in the States probably went into either low, double, or single digits. And um, before they started being, you know, coming back in with those cleared paperwork and all that stuff. But um, yeah, I've definitely seen it. I've definitely seen it. I had uh, what turned out to be six male. Uh, Pilbarensis or, you know, Hammer's Lionsis, Pilbarensis, the U.S., right? Yeah. U.S. Pilbarensis, which could be, you know, a one or both or a mix. Right. Yeah. Right. You know, <laughs> yeah. um, the, uh, where that caused its own set of problems. Um, so I certainly can appreciate where you're going with that. You know, I, I do think that's something. And I do think in terms of monitors, right, we see stuff that we know of and scientifically right in terms of fish and i think varanids have shown that they do the same thing where if you go back to you know love robin and chad but if you if you were to go back in uh, on the wayback machine let's say you'll see content that says hey whenever we have we put we raise up three acanthurus together it, it magically looks like 1.2 um, 95 percent of the time it magically looks like 1.2 um meaning that it's 1.2 being the natural implication there. And I, I know that that's not right. And I think the, the phenomenon that we're seeing is sort of the sneaker male situation where you have these males that appear to be females, whether they then will breed as males or not, you know, sort of, but it certainly speaks to groups of monitors from the late nineties through the, you know, through to 2010 or whatever, where people are taking that mindset and saying, Hey, I'm just going to, 
these monitors, you have to raise them as hatchlings together, and then you magically always wind up with these groups that look like a dominant male and the rest appear to be female. But some of those never produce eggs. And the <laughs> answer, to my mind at least, is that those that look like females doesn't mean that they're actually females. It just means they haven't developed the secondary characteristics that we associate with the, the male form. And so those groups where it's, oh, it's one point – they look like 1.2. I mean, you know, you got one that look, is obviously a male, and then you have two that look like females. But in reality, I've seen it where it's three males. Um, so that's obviously a social impact, right? The, so, the social, lives, social lives of reptiles, right, uh, that's at play there. So you're, you are effectuating that behavior. And, Lucas, I don't think, you know, it's wrong to say that there's uh, certainly an ethical question, if not problem, uh, with it forcing that development, right? Um, so, yeah, I think that's totally fair. At the okay. same time, hey, you mentioned that cute and cuddly picture. And, uh, yeah, they are cute and cuddly. I'm glad you admitted that. So I'll get it. <laughs> you can say some more. I, I've just said a bunch. I don't know well, how responsive I was. Or I will uh, out there, but, okay. I'll also just say, you know, in terms of it seemed to me in, in your opening point that the biggest uh, plus uh, in, in the column for cohabbing is – um, kind of exposing behaviors uh, that we can observe uh, that are unique to that situation. Is that is that fair to say? Does that feel like an oversimplification of your point? I don't know. My point might just be that it's cool and they're beautiful and you're allowing them to effectuate their, you know. That is activity. the word, effectuate. Yes, um, effectuate yeah. their, their natural behaviors. But I would say, again, that is purely for the benefit of the observer in many cases that doesn't necessarily mean that the uh that the behaviors in question are of benefit to the animal in fact maybe they are a product or of uh stress of um you know negative uh states of being that we might just perceive as something neat to observe. How does it yeah, benefit sure. the animal? I, can I jump Sometimes, in? Real, maybe. Or, yeah, go I for just, it. Justin. I just had, uh, I, Oh I God, I'm having this. flashbacks especially, to my thesis, <laughs> especially where uh, Lucas has challenged us both and, and got so cocky with it. No, <laughs> but I, I, I would, I would probably bring up in, in regards to lizards, like lizards tend to be much, and, and I think snakes to a certain degree are also social in some ways. You know, we, we don't know a ton about it, but I think keeping lizards by themselves sometimes is almost like, you know, putting something in solitary confinement. If they don't have that group structure, um, I mean, in, in nature, you go and you find a, a side blotch lizard male and there's two or three females around his rock and he's fighting with another male on this other rock, you know, so he's got his little territory and, the, you know, so I think lizard I lives especially – almost require some sort of uh, cohabitation to, to keep them with you that know, engagement properly is so their they don't fundamental, go crazy. You know, I will yeah. concede that <laughs> in the cases of lizards with a definite objective social structure and sociality that is just that's just a fact i will concede that obviously you should keep them that way same for uh potentially like a colony of garter snakes or something like that i i think that we can all agree that if it is part of their natural history to live in a family unit or to congregate then that's different um so i i would can we perhaps agree on that point and proceed in this debate with everything else. I think, but, but I mean, there is some complexity. I'll, I'll give an example. I wanted to bring this one up, but um, <laughs> my friend had a group of tree skiing, Sigourney striolata and had, uh, they had babies, right? And so there were five or six babies and pretty, and, and everybody was harmonious and, but they were kind of overrunning the, the capacity of the cage and more babies were coming or whatever. So he separated out the babies. And once he put, he took those babies and put them in another cage. All of a sudden all hell broke loose and three of them, you know, got beat up to to the point where they couldn't even be saved. And like, so, I mean, it was a bloodbath. And uh, so w you had a, you know, a defined structure with the, with the parents, but then as soon as you take them out, they're fighting for position or, or whatever. So, I mean, you do have to understand 
you know, kind of the, the social structure and, and maybe in a lot of cases we don't understand that and we don't know, but you know, I, I don't know that I would have thought that much. Like I would have thought, Oh, you just put them in a separate enclosure and everything will be fine. But we do know, you know, if there's multiple males in there, that can be problematic. And until we get, you know, Ben develops his, uh, sexing for skin sheds of, uh, uh, skinks, uh, we're kind of stuck, you know, working things out and just paying attention. I, I don't think anybody's suggesting cohabitation is a set it and forget it. You know, you do have to keep an eye on things. Right. And, and make sure that you're, you're, uh, intervening yes. when it doesn't work out. The two yes. things that jump out to me are kind of uh, the point that you raised there, Dr. J, in terms of I do think it requires more engagement from the key. A, one, it requires more engagement from the keeper to keep things together. And the yes. second thing, right, would be I think it is recognized either between recognizing slash acknowledging or imagining, depending on your point of view, <laughs> sort of the complexity of these creatures, as opposed to saying, no, they, they want to be safe and totally alone, desolate in a six-quart Rubbermaid box, right? <laughs> Those are two different approaches. And I, I wonder, right, coming, all of us, um, you know, particularly Lucas, are coming out of a, a time frame that's all about sort of the sterile keeping, right? That's the one perspective where at least Justin and I have have some more of sort of the Philippe school of, you know, creating these, creating environments where the stuff can engage with one another. That I think just in here in, here in the conversation, right, I can't help but feel that part of the language that speaks to they do best by themselves, isolated in little tiny boxes, comes from sort of the commercialism associated with mass Who breeding. said little tiny boxes? <laughs> I don't think anybody said that. Well, right. it, I mean, or it, it could be a slightly <laughs> larger box. In either yeah. case, in either case, to the point that you made, right? And I do think there's a ton of fairness to it of saying, like, sure, if they're in a football field size environment, right? There are places that, for animals to remove themselves from one another uh, with safety. That, regardless of the size of the the cage, almost certainly that's going to be space limited, so that we can't provide an equivalent situation. I, I totally acknowledge that. I think that's totally fair. That there's the capacity to get, the capacity to get away unconstrained by a cage will exceed that that is constrained by a cage. Absolutely. Um, but I just kind of wonder if a lot of the language around hey everything needs to be kept individually is related with keeping a lot of things and you know kind of the preference for sort of the big breeder style mentality that we touched on last week. But. I feel that there's an inherent contradiction in that point in that by definition, you can have more animals and fit more animals into the same space if you're cohabbing. So wouldn't cohabbing be more favorable if your goal was to be big box store and have as much going on as possible? It depends. Uh, so I think it depends, right? So if you're talking about putting adult cow kings in a six quart tub that's probably you know i mean there's only so much you can fit into that space if if that's our size definition but yeah so it all depends on the enclosure that you're putting them in with and are you acknowledging that hey the potential that things could go poorly so that probably means that you have to have an empty tub for for every tub that has a pair of snakes you also need to have an empty tub to be able to pull them apart should there be an issue or to feed them you know some things you can feed together when you keep them together other things you're asking for trouble, and it certainly means that you got to stand there and wait till they fully eat it, or you might end up with one instead of two. So, I mean, done properly, no, it won't save you any space because each one will have to have their own separate space that you could put them in, right? You're not. I totally mean, bound if by you're responsible, you to, then you that's the case. Well. But are we saying that everybody's responsible? <laughs> well, that'd be the position that I would advocate. You know, whether uh, people do that or not, people do all sorts of crazy stuff. I think. Uh, <laughs> I think inherently my, my snake bias is showing, right? And so I'll again say that I, I've never kept lizards without cohabbing, and there's probably a better case for many species of lizard. Um, however, I do think when – and, you know, of course you just brought up the point of needing to feed animals in a cohab situation and how much uh, can go wrong there, how much extra work that creates – um, how much extra handling in many cases when animals need to be separated, which is, you know, for some critters rather stressful. We just heard Dr. Gavin Bedford say that messing with an own pelly once made it not eat for another four months. Yeah. Um, 
you know, the, these aren't trivial things. Uh, well, one I would thing clarify that, that he, he was talking about a four hour interaction that was supposed to be what, 15, 20 minutes. So, uh, I don't know that objection he hearsay. Did, he did, he, he, <laughs> he did highlight that, uh, the, he perceives the animals to perceive him. Right. And so that there's a difference between how yes. he, uh, and I believe the it too. response to him I've heard and other people. From yeah. Many people. I think there's something to that. I'm, yes. I'm not discounting it, but by framing it in that way, I'm just trying to be clear, um, clear on that. Let that, the record show. Uh, I don't think that's, that, <laughs> that's exactly the situation that, that he was describing. I think he could probably separate. Certainly not. not. I, I invoked this, uh, example simply to highlight how devastating a spike in these stress hormones can be for these animals. And if we're talking about needing to handle some high stress animal every time we need to feed it because of a cohab situation, well, that could be pretty deleterious. Uh, I yeah. wanted to, that's, that's species by species, right? And certainly ev I think everything me, is species maybe, by species. Well, maybe the, the, the point that I would just want to highlight, you know, and I respect, I respect what you're saying there is just that like, to me, and I don't know that I framed this really well before, right, in terms of the commercial aspect and whatever, that in that framework, I guess in my mind, what I'm imagining is someone needs to make the interaction they have with a given uh, ecosystem, right, the given cage, as quick as possible. If you're going to cohab animals, right, you're going to have to double the time, at least double the time that you're interacting to perform that feeding, because you can totally successfully manage it. But I say double because they're the two animals together, but in reality, it's probably tripling, quadrupling, whatever, the amount of time because you have to fully see the process through. This is not throwing in a defrosted mouse and seeing what happens. This is waiting for them to fully consume each item. And if you're feeding multiple items in one go, I mean, literally, we could be talking about 10, 15, 20 minutes. A pair of rhino rats in an enclosure. Hey, you got to have four that are thought out, ready to go, and you're just feeding. Oh, oh, oh. And then if they get to the last one and the last one still isn't fully done, then you pull it out and whatever. So all that stuff, that's going to take, I don't know, between five and ten times longer than it would if you kept them separately and just tossed in something and, and closed the tub. Yes, indeed. No doubt so that it that's definitely, true. no doubt, makes the keeper's life harder and it raises the level of risk for the animals involved inherently to injure one another, perhaps themselves. Um, it does demand a greater degree of competency from the keeper. I, I will. Uh, <laughs> it does that. indeed happy to concede that point. Happy and to. will you also you concede it it easy? It was for the ease of the keeper, Lucas, but it's, the it, I said it's, that, yeah. it, I didn't say for the, it, <laughs> some people me, do that. that excuse way. me. Yeah. I, I <laughs> meant it's for ease of shoving as many animals into a small space as possible. I, yeah, but I nobody's mean, arguing that works, <laughs> you know, like that. Yeah, I agree. And, and I do think that uh, to Lucas's point, a lot of, a lot of these things like, you know, cohabbing and, and, and buying like like we talked about with the monitor world where they said, oh, if you buy, you know, three animals, you'll probably get a pair. And if you buy five animals, you're guaranteed to get a trio Absolutely. or whatever, you know, Couldn't and so, yeah. you know, this the salesman technique of, you know, and then you wind up with five male uh, pilbarensis. And, <laughs> oh, wait, and I don't think happen. it was even <laughs> intent with maybe one exception. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't think it was intended to be deceitful. Right. They genuinely no, look like yeah, you have a male it. and four female, you know, like yeah. that's, I, I don't. It, and then it's just confusing why it doesn't why it doesn't produce anything or it, mm -hmm. it produces less than it seems like it should right it'll be like yeah. i only get one clutch of eggs out of this you yeah. know and this, i think uh, 1.4 group wait that that all okay. kind of came from you know frank Redius and and you know after years and years of this i heard him tell people it works best in pairs Trio, you can do trios, but it works best as pairs. And I think, you know, that kind of went against what we heard in the early 90s. And probably pairs that are raised or, to yeah. to where they're showing their sexual secondary sexual characteristics, you mm. know, separately, and then mm -hmm. finding a pair that will go together, um, mm. you know, that will accept being in the presence of one another. That's really probably the ideal way to pair monitors at this mm. point. I, okay. I did, and I think even but, Frank came to that. Hold on. Yeah. yeah. Rewind. Record scratch. It makes things harder for the keeper and it increases the inherent risk for the animals. Not you use that as yeah. a point against me. 
as I'm just talking, saying, man. There, there's no, you know, points. <laughs> oh, is it not really a fight anymore? <laughs> well, I'm just, I'm just talking. Sorry, about I thought we were fighting. Negative. I'm just in the in the realm of reality. Like that's <laughs> all. <I'm, laughs> Well then, okay. Well then, I, I, don't, need to, I, I, don't, I need to I change my over, whole persona then it's, because it's, it's I do over, go have. <laughs> it's an oversimplification to say that it it results in damage to the animals. I don't. Think I didn't can, say damage in or, all cases. I said negative. it increases risk. Oh well, yeah, to feed cohabbed animals. Yeah. No, oh, absolutely. Well, I mean, theoretically. So what's the, the pro? That, the ones that'll advance. I hear a lot of cons. Man, like they'll eat their own tails. Like we've, <laughs> we've all been there. I mean, yeah. I, I've been I've been wanting to cite this for a little bit here. There's there's a cohab exhibit at the uh, California Academy of Sciences, an AZA accredited institution in San Francisco, uh, where there are uh, I believe four uh, Prettles pythons and for Woma pythons in a cylindrical tall enclosure where the Womas are mostly terrestrial on the floor in the rocks and the brettles have branches to get out of there. Now I have a coworker who is a biologist at said institution. And I know for a fact that after every time they feed those animals, they now have a protocol where they have to wash every single one because the Womas will try to eat anything that moves when they put them back in there because everything smells like rodent. <laughs> How is that of benefit to anybody except the third graders on their the field trip that see a lot of snakes? Coming to appreciate the beauty of reptiles. I mean, yeah. coming to become fascinated with Australia. Yeah. Expanding their minds? What? That that's nothing. No, no that's no, not you, nothing. You, However, you are we egg. arguing that cohabbing is good for educating the public, or whether it's a good practice for herpeticulture? Well, it probably is actually good for educating the public, right? Because the biggest question when folks go to a zoo or aquarium is, can they see the animal within what five or ten seconds? And if the answer is no, then they wind up moving on. So that's not making much of an impact if you have one animal in there that's hidden away. So yeah, probably cohabbing does influence the the capacity of a given enclosure to influence someone's life. And in, citing AZA, they have a lot of crazy rules. Like, I mean, that could <laughs> that could make no difference saying, at all. You know, if you wash your wash the snakes now, uh, you know, obviously they you know they have to do certain things or else they're not AZA accredited. They have to. Put also, a I don't know if I was supposed to talk about that. So, yeah, all the no, listeners are pinky <laughs> promise to secrecy about that. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, we sounds like we, a good practice. So <laughs> there was a there was a uh, confiscation of some lizards. By, and and they went to a major zoo, and we went and saw them at this major zoo, and they had them all in the same cage, even though, I mean, technically they were all the same species. They were all Agernia depressa at the time, and this was before the big split. But the person who brought them out of Australia knew that they were different and kept, you know, had different trade names for these different types. But uh, the zoo, oh, they're all Agernia depressa. So they put them all in one cage, and when we went and saw them, there were there was Depressa in one corner and Signitos in another corner and you know Epsisolus in another corner. They were all separate and and we and you could see kind of battle scars and things and we said, Now, why are you keeping these all in the same cage? They're obviously different. They're obviously choosing separate sides of the, the enclosure. Why aren't you separating them? You know, it looks like they've got some damage. Ah, oh, they're fine. No big deal. <laughs> like and this is one of the biggest zoos in the world. You know, it's like, come on, guys, really? So is your so, point that yeah. my but the point, point is, is if the keeper is not in tune, yes, it can be a negative and negative thing. But if it's somebody like myself and notices these things and says, OK, it's time to separate these groups into the groups that they're preferring, you know, like this, this one's. This one's a antisocial. I'm going to take this one out and maybe and see how the interaction goes from there. You know, if you're keep paying attention, it does demand that around. responsivity. Yeah, absolutely. So it and, does. And yeah, sound. that does take more time. But at the same time, the animals that have that social structure in nature, like Egernia depressa, they they want to be in a group. They they right, have which fit under my asterisk from earlier yeah. of you know no no contest. But what it sounds like, what I'm hearing. 
here in the Fight Club Is octagon. Is it a Kumata? Then it's in the exception. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> no! What I'm hearing is a consensus from from both of you that what I have been saying is correct, uh, which is that <laughs> cohabbing is pretty much only for the benefit. No, 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 no. I think Rob brought that observation. up. I mean, my favorite the part animals. of cohabbing that, that Rob brought up was that they know each other's cycles. So you don't have to introduce them every week and make sure that they're that you know, that you witness a copulation or whatever you you're there together they know each other's cycles. They don't have to breed. You know, you're not tiring out your male with endless breeding introductions and strategies because they know their cycle. They know when the female is receptive. So they, they, they breed at that time and no other time. It's not for recreation. It's for procreation. So they, they get the job done. You hardly ever see it. And then you see eggs and, and it works out like a dream. And when the females obviously grab it, I'll take the male out so he doesn't cause any undue stress and things were great because you so have a separate case a, for him because oh. you're not you're not utilizing this as an opportunity okay so to it's not more cohabbing in the same box right and you know it's not it's cohabbing per se it's cohabbing. it's extensive pairing but no i'll, I'll sometimes well, i'll leave the him in there, in there? And <laughs> the female lay and it's not a big deal right or if it's an off season like occasionally yeah. i'm sure you had seasons where they didn't produce anything yeah. despite being yeah. you know paired together that whole time honestly i thought and there's also cases where they'll get bred to death because they're always together. Well, uh, yeah, maybe, I mean, maybe, that's we, we can, hold on. Let me put a pin in that one. We'll, we'll put it. <laughs> I'm just trying to fight that. guys. I don't know. Yeah. No, I've, I've yeah. never seen that with snakes. Like, you know, what oh, I mean? false water cobras. Absolutely. Well, I don't keep those crazy things. <laughs> <laughs> that means they don't that's, exist. That's then the <laughs> They don't exist. Um, exactly. <laughs> the part I was going to say, what I assumed the grievance with the Wiccans, um, build would would have been would be that oh. you're going to just produce all these leopard geckos right inherently if you're putting together this with that structure with a male and these five females i would have assumed that it was actually the the push would be against hey you're just going to make all these leopard geckos and they're all going to be half siblings and all this stuff if you that would be how i it, and you think probably as well keep track of it but i don't yeah, think that's, that's what people were mad about i think if if i'm interpreting it correctly i think that the beef was more about the just concept of keeping leopard geckos together at all and not the amount more, of animals yeah, in not the just space. Singly, right. Right. Yeah. No, yeah. I, I think I take it that same way, but that was surprise, you know, again, coming to this late and then with sort of a different perspective, I was just sort of befuddled about that. Cause I would have assumed, I do think there's something to be said for that. Right. Maybe the, one of the biggest cons associated with cohabitation, at least to the extent that you are talking about, um, you know, a mixed gender pair would be the possibility of reproduction, meaning animals that you don't necessarily have a home or a market for. And that's sort of where I thought that would go, right? Is why can't it just be those five females together? Um, you know, that, that sort of natural implication with that mixed gender situation that you were going to produce more offspring. That's what I assumed it would be. And then it wasn't, which I found pretty weird. Right. I see what you're saying. Yeah. They, they would have still burned him at the stake. <laughs> right. That, which was, which is super, just super strange. And uh, I mean, pretty unfat. I mean, I guess a, an aspect of this to consider, right, is sort of what are the implications of the educational materials, whatever form that might take of, of the stuff, we, of the content that has been put out there over time that has brought us to from the universe where leopard gecko breeding in captivity literally went from people are overstating it a little bit. I think it was you know, cattle stock, Ron Tramper cattle stock troughs with five males and a hundred females or whatever, right? So that actually is a situation where within that, maybe there, there was such density as we talked about earlier that you could actually put together multiple leopard, male leopard geckos without an issue. But that's the universe that we've come from. And now the notion that you would keep two together is, right. um, you know, beyond the pale. Yeah is really something and suggests maybe we need to critically evaluate the content that we're putting out and whether <laughs> you know, kind of where we're at, it raises all sorts well, of nobody things. would fight that. And, uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll drop the, the devil's advocate fighting, uh, persona and, and we can just chat now. But basically <laughs> what I would say is I think when people are writing these internet care sheets or filming their, uh, how to take care of this species videos for YouTube. I think that the, uh, the 
the cop out is to just always say cohabitating not recommended and then you're free of any liability as a author or creator for anything that might go wrong. Um, that doesn't mean in any case that it can't be done or that it shouldn't be done. I just think it's a, it, it has become a universal way of washing hands of any potential problem that somebody could come back and say, look what you've done. My beloved Jeffrey is dead. Um, so right. Involved. So I, I, and like you're saying, uh, a generation of keepers entering the hobby, digesting that information as their proprietary source of knowledge, uh, would lead to a general populace that would point at cohabiting leopard geckos as, uh, satanic practice. <laughs> I didn't know you could keep them individually. I thought they were always <laughs> cohabitated. <laughs> Maybe yes. that's being bring being uh brought up in the box store mentality of, you know, keeping reptiles and just keeping producing to produce them everything and all you can. Yeah. yeah. And I mean that's that was the common practice, right? To have a tub with with one male yeah. and five females. One male and, and, and four and three to five females and, and all go in there Same with African fat tails. And, yeah. I would have people when I was working at the vivarium come try to fight the employees a few times a week about multiple leopard geckos <laughs> being for sale yeah. in the same enclosure, bearded dragons, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so yeah. Yeah. Again, I, I now dropping the, the persona, uh, <laughs> I feel that the correct, and nuanced way to discuss this is that, like you've been saying, there are situations where it totally works and you might just have to be a little bit more on top of your, you know what, as a keeper. Um, there are situations where it totally works and you really don't need to be. I keep entire litters of garter snakes together. I feed them together. There are nothing bad happens. It's fine. Um, you know, it, it is completely species dependent and, uh, environment dependent, animal dependent, yeah. you dependent. How much time are you available to watch and make sure things are actually going well? Do you have the time to separate the animals and see this feeding process through like Rob was describing earlier? So, um, and there can be like all these fights, true, you know? right? We're not, yeah. To, to your point, right. That's not always, you know, we're. I do think it demands a greater level of availability, uh, skill, and care that's being put into right. it. And we're not, not all always. universally available, you know, yeah. to, to meet those needs, right? And so sometimes it could be great. And other times if you're away on a tour, away on a trip, you know, that's yeah. what we're – whatever. Like then we're taking a greater risk than someone who's keeping them separately, right? You know, you're unlikely to have an animal uh, alone by itself in a cage – eat a cage mate, then no, not impossible, right? People have we've seen that where things will get out and go into another cage and eat it or whatever. They were intended to be kept singly and then you wind up with one. So there you go. Um, you know, for sure. And yeah. I have had, that, yeah. Yeah. In go practice for. as a keeper, I've had both wonderful and horrendous things happen as a result of my cohabiting animals. Um, in most cases, the, horrendous things could have been prevented by me being a better keeper. Um, and you know, that's, that's the risk you take. Uh, if you, I think we could also say that for the opposite, you know, I've, I've kept things singly and I've had horrendous things happen, you know, when I keep sure. things by themselves too. So it's, you know, of there's course. no guarantee that keeping them separate is not, is going to prevent any bad thing from happening. You know? I agree with what you're saying. That yeah. that's not necessarily what I was implying either. I, yeah. I meant more, more specifically the at the hands of the yeah. other. Uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, and and to your point about breeding, Justin, um, there's no doubt that it is advantageous for the animals to be familiar with each other. They're not overexcited. They're not, you know, blowing their load, uh, if you will, at the wrong time. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, however, um, could you be less scientific with your uh, terminology? <laughs> no, um, <laughs> I don't think you uh, understand what you're saying. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, yeah. yes. Uh, 
crap what was i saying um <laughs> sorry <laughs> that's okay uh, yeah oh but no i was just gonna say you can game. also uh, uh keep solitary and then introduce and mm. then they eat each other like it, they could still mm. kill each other if they're only together for 10 minutes you know so yeah breeding is breeding yeah that's true. I mean, and, and sometimes you might, you might be able to argue that that would be a more likelihood if they're unfamiliar with each other, right. introducing them then, Oh, is this a food item? Is this a mate? You know, I'm going right. to strike first and ask questions later, you know, and I, I love to, to cohab, uh, baby anteresia. Like when they hatch, I'll put them all in one tub and let them, you know, hang out together. And, and it seems like, I mean, you know, they're, they're all kind of, clumped together. And I think in, in the wild, we see examples of that, you know, you've got the, um, the timber rattlesnakes where multiple females will go to a, a decent spot and have all their litters. And one female will watch litters of others. They've kind of sh shown that scientifically that these females are caring or helping to whatever they're doing for other litters. Um, you know, maybe that happens in the wild. We don't know a lot about what's in the wild, but if you leave them together too long, all of a sudden you've got one less and, and a big fat, you know, baby that probably won't survive <laughs> either. So, right. you know, it's not the best case scenario. So you, you do have to make sure that you're separating them in time as well. And, and who knows, maybe in the wild, they'll eat the weak one and, and that's their first meal and they go about their you know business. I don't, who, who knows if that's the case? Cause we don't have a lot of information on dispersion and, and, uh, how, how long these little baby, uh, anteresia or any Python kind of stick, stick together with the, the mom or in the same area as each other. So, yeah. For what it's sad. worth, I see this, that with, the. Uh... Um, across multiple litters of both Calabothrus that I keep, the Puerto Ricans mm -hmm. and Jamaican bows, where when they're, I'll pull them all together um, and leave them together until they shed. And invariably you come into an entire pile of all of them together within a given tub. Um, and that, and that goes for, yeah. it'll stay like that for a week, two weeks, something mm -hmm. like that, where they're Garter snakes sort of, will they are aggregating together. Yeah. And, that, the Ackies would do that for me as well. When I had a, big bunch of baby Ackies in the, you know, a big, uh, cattle trough, you know, there was no reason for them to do that other than choosing to. Um, yeah. so I, I agree with that as well. And I, I do think that it is very, very worth doing, uh, to observe the behaviors, uh, that like you were mentioning at the beginning. Um, yeah, I do think the, the point you raised that really is, super important though is in terms of planning things out that people would just for your own sanity and potential functionality of the system you have to be planning it as though everything could go by itself should things go sideways on you i do think that's mm -hmm. a great point this isn't a mechanism to save space or have twice as much stuff like right. you should the plan should be that oh, okay when they're uh, paired together be it for a day or a year you know or a year or indefinitely there, there should be a separate space where you could pull them apart if you had to. Yeah, like my rhinos. Yeah, when you needed <laughs> yes. to use it, basically right away. <laughs> yeah. What, what do you think about uh, different species cohabbing? Because mm. I, I mean, like you said, the the I, and the brettles in, in exhibit. I love to see that kind of. It's stuff, an amazing you know? exhibit. Yeah, yeah I, right? I just needed to shit on it for the persona, but it's one of my favorite exhibits. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I, I, uh, I absolutely personally love, uh, cohabbing between different species that share the same environment. You know, truly mm -hmm. I, I am, I get a bit of the ick if it's, you know, like two species that can exist together, but they're from like two different continents, yeah. like just because yeah. they can, I don't think we should, yeah. but if it's illustrating more like of a from Africa. ecosystem <laughs> than, yeah. Right, right, exactly. Well, yeah, yeah, I mean, so that what that reminds me of, right? So Denver Zoo for a long time has had an enclosure that has chondros and emeralds in together that do mm -hmm. well, uh, you know, and that's maybe sort of the the sweet spot, right? Of having to the point that you're raising of saying, okay, things that wouldn't otherwise go together. This is they're entirely making the point, right? In terms of you have this. Yes, if they have yeah, a plaque exactly explaining right. that they evolved this <laughs> way completely separately, then, then I'm happy with yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. like one one uh, exhibit at the Baltimore Aquarium was really cool. It had a an aki, uh, a gurney, a hosmeri, a hosmer skink, you know, a spiny-tailed skink. It had uh, uh, 
bearded dragon, a frilled lizard, like, you know, just wow. kind of one of each or a pair of each mm-hmm. or whatever. And they, mm-hmm. they had their little corners of the area. Um, there's an exhibit at the um, Perth Zoo that has like, it's a very large, expen- ex- expansive um, enclosure, just like glass walls around it and kind of covering the middle section of their reptile house. And it's got uh, shingle backs and Western blue tongues and frilled lizards and bearded dragons. And they all kind of can do their thing totally. and get away from each other if they need to, you know? So it's really kind of cool, but I, I imagine there's yeah. still like I was in uh, Alice Springs and they had uh, an enclosure kind of similar to that. And they had some shingle back skinks and some, and I hear this horrible noise and I look over and these shingle back skinks are like battling to the death. They're like cho- <laughs> chomping on each other's tail. You know, like chasing each other around. So I'm like, uh, you might want to separate. He's like, oh, thank you. And he ran in and grabbed one and took it out, you know, put it in a different enclosure. So, I mean, you know, you still need to pay attention, even if there's a plenty yeah. of space for them to get away from each other. Sometimes they'll just harass and pursue, you know, until they kill the other one, you know, if that, if that's yep, their right. goal and, and they'll do that in the wild too. It's not to that's say that exactly the wild is some, say. you know, yeah. utopia nature where being nature. <laughs> everybody's happy and yeah, they, they'll chase each other down and kill each other in the wild right. too. You know, like how so, naturalistic do you really exactly. want naturalistic? Yeah. 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 And, and that yeah. stress and those kind of things can sometimes, I mean, there is a level I think of good stress. I mean, you talk about stress, like, you know, it's only a negative, but I think, in I also ways, agree you know, for the record. Yeah. Yeah. There's like that drive. To, I hate who to I live was. And <laughs> uh, but you know, that uh, there, there is some level of, of good stress, I think in, in some of these cases. And, you know, of course that requires us to know these animals, know their natural history, know what they need and what, what they don't need, you know? So. Right. I mean, the thing, as you guys were describing both the, both the Baltimore and the Perth, Zoo, just the, the skill and intuitiveness that would be required to make an enclosure that could provide the functionality for all those different things really reflects well on the, you know, the capabilities of the keepers that are making that even possible, right? You know, in terms of saying how within this box or within this sphere or whatever, can we make uh, a suitable atmosphere for all these, for this diversity of uh, ecosystems and needs? That's super impressive. Um, It was a big emphasis in the, the zoo science master, um, mixed species exhibits i had to you know write a bunch of papers on that for herp class memology a bunch of different uh you know uh, types of animals because it is such a delicate balance and it's a thought exercise uh at at the beginning that you don't you're never going to know how it goes until it's put into practice but um you know yeah. there you can think endlessly about the different variables there and try to create something that won't end in disaster. <laughs> yeah. Some, some individuals are just jerks. Like right. there was a fly river turtle and it would just chase around all the other turtles and just harass them and nip at them. And so, so they just had to like either make a way for the turtles to get somewhere where it couldn't follow or, you know, or just take it out and put it somewhere else for a while or yeah. put it in isolation. You know, that's kind of some, some animals are, just for whatever reason, just want to see, see right, the world Sandy. burn. The jokers, <laughs> the jokers of the, yeah, the feisty felines. <laughs> uh, I mean, even the Monterey Bay Aquarium was able to pull off cohabbing a great white shark for a while. They couldn't do it yeah. indefinitely, but you know, uh-huh. that's I pretty think, impressive. <laughs> I, 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 I should say recall. cohabbing with tuna and like everything that would fit. I'm not talking about multiple sharks. I'm talking yeah. about prey. <laughs> like, <laughs> Yeah. Well, and, and I think, you know, a lot of times they have those really, I mean, I, again, I love those uh, multi-species exhibits, you know, where you have like a bunch of different fish and some, you know, turtles and some frogs yes. or snakes or something, you know, that's pretty cool. Um, good, good I stuff. Agree. So, and I think if, that's if done why, right, you know, cohabbing can be so fun at home is because it definitely makes it more like a zoo in your living room um a piece of nature in your house you know i i get that that's why i do it so yeah Yeah. and how about cohabbing uh prey species i've got a a mealworm colony that's thriving in my roach (laughs) colony so i have two two prey species in the same box yeah it works out great you need to keep your crickets singularly (laughs) in 
weekly organized pill containers. Yeah. Speaking of <laughs> AZA, they have to do welfare checks on their insect colonies. Like they have to go through really? and pick up each roach and make sure it's okay. And like there's different – I mean they they kind of take those things to the to the extreme because – the public demands it and you know, they're supported by public funds in a lot of cases. So yeah. Yep. Now and we, you know, we should care as much as that about our, our reptiles that we keep, you know, there's no disposable animals. So don't just be like, Oh, I'll just, right. you know, if I, if this thing eats this, I'll just buy another one. You know, that's not the, the best attitude to have. <laughs> yes. Yeah. With the illusion of fight broken, um, are there any species that either of you guys would never cohab? I mean, I think there are are some. Uh, yeah, I mean, definitely, there's there's some reptiles that that are solitary and that try to kill each other if they necessarily <laughs> come into contact too often or something like that. I'm trying to think. It seems like certain chameleons are like that. The the Namaqua yeah. chameleons are pretty – they'll yeah. they'll cannibalize younger, smaller animals all the time in the wild in captivity too. So, you know, you wouldn't want to keep your Namaqua chameleons together. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have that option here. They're, they're Although maybe doing, soon. It seems like yeah. they're really taking off in Europe, which is yeah. which is cool. They're, um, they're such a yeah, cool Yeah, we touched species. on that a couple of times. Yeah, mm. so bad. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I think – Right. The natural history, it would be those things like that where the natural history reflects that they stay far apart. As, but they, sort of the inverse of that is like the Solomon Island tree bow is where those things live on. Obviously, a great density of them lives on the handful of small islands that they do based on the number that have been exported from the Solomon Islands over time. They must live in incredible concentrations. And that's sort of seconded by what I, the behavior I see from the males towards one another and how they interact with females and all this stuff. Clearly, those are an animal that li has a social structure that they need to accommodate, right? The opposite mm. would be like Namaqua, where it's these individual road warriors, right, just going about going about life, trying to jam anything they can in their mouth and not get eaten by the thing one step bigger. Um, yeah. And yeah. So that, the other thing practically is anything yeah. that is so big and fast that it's really unmanageable to try and be feeding them together. Right. So that if we're talking about false water cobras, that's probably pretty hectic and you got to be on your game. And and there are probably times where even someone who's really on their game might fall short and that could have really serious consequences. Rhino rat snakes, you're totally fine. They're not that fast. It's not that big of a deal. <laughs> Just, <laughs> like you, or species that require such, uh, you know, great personal distance or, or personal range that yeah. it, it's it's not feasible not to do that in the same it. enclosure because yeah. they need their space. But, you know, you can't provide it unless you have a warehouse or something, you know, the like crocodile yeah. monitors or something. It might be very difficult to cohab those. Croc monitors. Yeah. yeah. I was thinking that, too. Yeah. I mean, and I'm sure it's happened to you guys if it's happened to me already. In my young career, I've had instances where I've got stuff paired up that they would never look at each other as food, but it's nighttime and something moves wrong and they just grab each other because something yeah. moved out of the yeah. corner of their eye. You know, that's happened to me with brettles like three times. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. yeah brettles are some some of the worst offenders at that. If, yeah. <laughs> you know, like you usually have to have them on opposite sides of the cage or, or in, you know, separate cages right. or else they're, yeah, they're very and, reactive. And I think too, with, with, you know, pythons and, you know, things that aren't eating on a daily basis, separating to feed is probably not that big of a deal or not right. that much of a stressor. You know, if you're having to separate them twice a month when you feed them as adults, Agreed. it's not yeah. too big a deal. In the cases I'm referencing, though, there wasn't even food involved. It's just yeah, <laughs> nighttime oh, and mine something moves wrong. Smell food yeah. in the room, yeah. and they yeah, and something moves. Yeah. They're grabbing it. Yeah, it's uh, it can be obnoxious. You're like, come on, guys, <laughs> knock it off. <laughs> Enough <laughs> of it. But I but I have noticed that I rarely see any long term effects from snakes grabbing each other. Even though like sometimes mm -hmm. you're yeah. like prying them apart, and you're like, man, they're they're gonna be messed up, but. I, I really haven't seen that. Um, nice. It's it's I've never had like a, a, a big wound, you know, maybe mm -hmm. if you had like a couple males that you didn't know were males and you left them together. I mean, carpets can rip each other to shreds in that yeah. case. But I think a prey, you know, going for prey, it's, you know, it, it is there is a risk, but uh, 
you know, I've seen it happen quite a few times and I've never, you know, at least knock on wood, I haven't seen any major issues in my collection from that. I think that's pretty much right. Uh, the thing that it reminds me of um, is that that Loxosemus in the reproductive husbandry book that is just totally destroyed. It was two males, I believe, were kept together. And it's just, uh, talk about a gruesome photo where we're talking about ex deep beyond sort of imagination lacerations and things. It, I think maybe it's Dallas or Fort Worth to do something like that where inadvertently left two males together and uh, horrific, truly horrific. And some of these things, it seems like with rhinos at least, the their skin is super resilient to everything but the teeth of their own species. <laughs> so there's a thing most yeah. likely to cause them damage, and it looks like he took uh, like a razor blade to it. You know, yeah, whereas, you see it with dry mark on a lot. Yeah, where they're pretty resilient to say you have like a mouse will grab it and the um, I've actually seen it where the scale scales will pull away but not be perforated. There's no wound, but a copulatory bite from their own species can slice them open. You know, the almond shaped wound like a sort of a razor blade type cut. It's it's pretty uh, pretty interesting. And, I mean, you'll but see I agree with you, Prey, too, you know, right? the yeah. feeding, but uh, exactly, you know, and I do think you're right to point out to highlight that like a feeding bite is different than a uh, combatant bite or a copulatory mm -hmm. bite mm -hmm. in terms of what that usually looks like. Totally. Well, <laughs> well, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Any this other, is fun. Uh, I, I think there yeah. are great points, you know, to, yeah. to all sides here. I hope so. Yeah, I, been, I mean, great talking to you, man. Oh, yeah. it's always great talking to you guys. Again, I would just clarify that most of the first half was was not real. <laughs> I I go have a lot. No, we uh, want we want a strong advocate. Often, I feel yeah. like I don't uh, I don't uh, stick to the format enough. Right, I break the fourth <laughs> wall on this stuff too much. So yeah. I love the hit love me, the Rob. <laughs> Sorry, that was we, too much. We've been we've been accused of being yeah reptile love club instead of <laughs> reptile fight club. there's no fighting that usually you know real fighting that goes on. But I mean I do I do think there are a lot of good you know points that were brought up on both sides that you know you need to be aware of, and I think that's the purpose of the show is to show it from both sides. We don't have anybody coming in here saying you only ha cohabitate or you never cohabitate. You know it's it's a mix, and that's any topic if you. <laughs> If somebody believes that one topic is completely one-sided, then they probably don't understand it, you know, and that's totally. kind of what we're bringing out here. And, you know, yeah, we, we do break the fourth wall. We, we maybe entice people in to see, ooh, Reptile Fight Club. I want to watch people duking it out. But in reality, you know, there's very few duking, duke fests that go on here. There's been a few. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> well, some I've just rolled over and given up because I couldn't gain control, <laughs> but you know, that's, that's a different matter. <laughs> so yeah, we, I have yeah, one in do, mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We do like to, uh, to see both sides. We do like to see kind of from, from both perspectives. And I, and I do, you know, I, I'm trying to think I, we might've talked about cohabitation on one of the previous shows, but I do it, think it feels these, like wait, you probably have. Yeah. yeah. I, but these it, topics are, are topical. Yeah. yeah, deep enough. And, and I people. think, yeah, different perspectives and different insights and, and experiences. So I think that's kind of what this is all about. And I think, you know, you, we find ourselves as keepers discussing the same topics a lot too. And, and mm -hmm. we can learn new things and change our perspective and say, Oh, I'm never going to do that again. Or, Oh, I, how did I not think of this? You know? So that's yeah. kind of what we're aiming for. And hopefully listeners got, uh, got that from this, the show. And I, I, I thought there's some really cool points brought up and yeah. Thanks for, uh, f to both of you for yeah. <laughs> battling it out. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. thank you both. Yeah. You need a name <laughs> for your, uh, alter ego there, Lucas. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, right. Leekus Lou or something. <laughs> <laughs> Lucas P. <laughs> <laughs> Watch out for that. Lucas, Leekus Lou. He's, he's a, he's, he's a scrapper. <laughs> He's a rotten bastard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, where where can people find you and see your the cool things you're up to? Yes, uh, Centralian Exotics is my reptile pseudonym. Uh, you can find me there. Uh, www.centralianexotics.com. Uh, the same name on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, 
That's it. Listen to him. On, <laughs> oh, uh, uh, yeah, Monday? Carpets and Coffee. Yeah, Carpets every and, is it Monday? Every other Monday. Yeah, yeah, you every other Monday. From Friday to Monday, because you guys had a life and wanted to go do things on Friday. They keep right? using that as the excuse. But <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if it was really my life. No. Yeah. Um, yes, and we don't stick to the schedule very well, but uh, <laughs> it is. Uh, it's extracurriculars. Yeah. For it's a all fun involved. show too, and you can watch it live. Get on YouTube, make comments. Yes, you know, it's, it's it's a really fun show. So I, mm-hmm. I enjoy it. I try to get on there when I remember it's on. <laughs> I, I'm old. Always love when we see it in there. So, yeah, it's fun to yeah. fun to get on and poke the bear. You know, make fun <laughs> of Owen or something. <laughs> yes, the bear yeah. is Owen. <laughs> <laughs> and if it's too if it's too off the wall, they just ignore you. So it's it works out. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So well, thank you so much uh, for having me and I love this show <laughs> and I listen to it a lot. Uh, well, we appreciate it. We, we uh, enjoy it when we can bring people on who listen and, and understand <laughs> what we're going for and, and have some, you know, good, good points of view. So I'm sure we'll have you back. And again, yeah. I, I apologize. We didn't have you on earlier. So <laughs> that's all right. If any of the listeners were finding themselves just, you know, really hating my voice, like they just really like that guy's got a punch in the face voice, like challenge me, let's go. I'll fight you. I don't, I'll fight anyone on the internet from yeah. safe distance. <laughs> oh, I, I about reptile the, the, topics. Yeah, about reptile yeah. topics. Uh, I love With Justin old, to hold my hand. <laughs> those old stories of like the, the old reptile shows where different personalities would get together and actually fight, you know, because they, <laughs> they hated each other's perspectives or the way they were doing stuff. And yeah, good times. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I guess we won't get into those stories on here, but uh, <laughs> maybe for another show. <laughs> All right. Well, any, any cool, st- uh, you know, herpetological things you've seen, over the last mm. week or any, anything neat that you've seen recently and in, in regards to herp life, I kind of mentioned that, that video and seeing, you know, I just making me itch to get out to herp again. I need to <laughs> get out there. I guess I have some trips coming up fairly soon, so I'm excited for that. But. Oh man. Yeah. I, I feel like there has to have been, uh, <laughs> but, oh, you know, there were, okay. Yeah. For, for the super dorks out there, there was a really good, um, PBS Eons video okay. on YouTube that talked about uh Alapids and uh the like history of how everything else on the planet had to evolve to them having venom. So that was a really good one uh, that I oh, enjoyed cool. as someone that doesn't keep venomous or you know do much with that side of things. It was a pretty pretty fascinating little video. So I'd recommend people go watch that. That is neat. PBS puts yeah. out some good programs. I was watching yeah. one the other week on uh, whales and nice. uh, they were doing a necropsy on a whale and they, they were pulling out the stomach and it's, it's got chambers. Like it's like a, like a cow, you know how they have, well, they used to be hoof chambered stock. stomachs. Yeah. And they, they yes. evolved from like a common ancestor of, of indeed. They uh, just yeah, moved like a, into the ocean and never left. <laughs> exactly. And I told that to some of my colleagues in the agricultural university, you know, and that, that work with livestock and they, they didn't know that cows had chambered stomachs, just like their oh. <laughs> uh, cows and, you know, sheep and stuff. So that was, that was kind of cool to learn something yeah. you know, interesting about that. I, I just love those nature documentaries. That's my favorite. Totally. Setup. Me too. Yeah. The, the Eon shorts are always very entertaining and, you know, it's everything from natural history to hominid stuff and yeah. everything in between. So it's cool. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Well, tell you Aussies out there, keep those hurt videos coming onto YouTube. I could do without the music choices sometimes. <laughs> like, I don't know what it is, but I, it just rubs me the wrong way. <laughs> Got your muzzin over there. <laughs> yeah. It's the muzzin <laughs> way. I guess uh, we need more rock music or something. I oh my would... days. He needs some <laughs> Taylor Swift. <laughs> Yeah, that's apparently that's what everything but electronica sounds like to Nipper is Taylor Swift. So, uh, well, I guess she oh, rules dear. the reason the world for a reason, you know, <laughs> controlling our elections and <laughs> calling the the Super Bowls. You know, it's it's all Taylor Swift. <laughs> I believe oh, boy. it. Oh, yeah. boy. good times, good times. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks for. Uh, 
joining us here. And thanks for listening to another episode of Reptile Fight Club. We'll see you again next Fight week. Club.